It's really great to be here together with all of you. Uh, and I hope you've all been inspired by the last two days like I've been. Uh, I think it's always, uh, you know, it's kind of like being plugged into the internet directly uh, when you come to this kind of event. And uh, while I look forward to a day of actually that it being for real, uh, this is about the closest we can get to it uh, today. I, I know how precious all of your time is too, so I really appreciate you spending that time with us. And uh, I also want to thank all of you, many of you, for your business and your partnerships with us. Uh, we really appreciate that and look forward to many fine years of that. Now, I also want to thank uh, Chip from Lulu Lemon, uh, who presented earlier for this sweatshirt I'm wearing, uh, which I really like. Uh, so uh, just wanted to give that quick ad also. Um, now, when I was 12 or so, uh, my parents actually gave me an autobiography of Tesla. And uh, you know, when I say Tesla, maybe some of you think of the rock band. Uh, maybe you think of the electric car company now. Uh, but actually, it refers to Nikola Tesla, uh, which was, you know, when I was 12, I guess that was probably the main choice. And, uh, you know, I, I thought I wanted to be an inventor when I grew up. And, you know, I, I was sort of, you know, brought up with computers. I was really lucky to get my first computer when I was six, because uh, my dad was a computer science professor. Uh, that was in 1978, so pretty unusual thing to do. And, uh, you know, I, I thought I wanted to be an inventor, and I read this book, and this was like the greatest inventor you could imagine. I mean, he was kind of an evil, mad scientist. You know, he made lightning bolts, and uh, he made the things that we use for electric power now. We still use Tesla designs, basically, to generate and distribute our electric power. And, you know, once I, I finished reading this story uh, of, of his life, you know, I basically cried at the end. Because uh, I realized, like, well, you could be this world's greatest inventor, uh, and you could basically be a failure, right? Uh, you know, you could have trouble funding your inventions. Uh, Tesla was actually working hard on transmitting power across continents wirelessly. And it's still not known exactly what he had in mind. Uh, and it might be if he was uh, better able to fund uh, his, his research, we would actually have that today. That's not that unlikely, probably. So I kind of vowed, well, what do, you, what do you actually do about this? Well, you actually need to invent things, and you need to get them to people. Uh, you really need to, to commercialize those inventions. And obviously, the best way we've come up with doing that uh, is through companies. Uh, and so I figured, you know, eventually, uh, I want to invent things and get them to people and get them to use them uh, and to benefit the world that way. Uh, and that's kind of been my goal since. And I think our goals for Google, if you understand it in that context, make more sense. Uh, that's actually our goal for Google. It's super simple. Uh, we want to build technology. Uh, that everybody loves using, uh, and that really affects everyone. Uh, you know, we really want to create beautiful, intuitive, uh, you know, services, technologies that are so incredibly useful for people, so incredibly useful uh, that people use them, you know, twice a day. Like you might use a toothbrush, right? Uh, and there aren't that many things you use twice a day. It's actually pretty hard uh, to come up with something like that. Now, uh, we actually just roughly hit our 13th birthday at Google, uh, and I think we're running a doodle now or something. It's always a little bit of a debate exactly when our birthday is. You know, We didn't really start paying ourselves or start working. It's a little bit amorphous, but we're roughly there, and it's been a while. And uh, I think that you know, looking back on what's been successful, well, what have we done that's really worked well? Uh, having a user focus uh, and also iterating really fast have really been determined what was successful. Now, I like, you know, in thinking back about search, you know, why did we start doing search? Uh, you know, we were doing some research at Stanford. We thought it might be interesting. And we actually were talking to all the people in the industry, you know, who were doing different kinds of search. Uh, and we said, you know, if you type, we, we, had, we had done some interesting research about ranking things better. And, uh, you know, we had typed in, you know, university. Uh, into the search engines at the time. And it was amazing, you know, when you type that, you basically got random web pages. Uh, you got pages that said university twice in the title. And we said, you know, we went to the people who made these search engines and said, why, why are you doing that? Why, why would I want a page? And they said, well, this is user error, right? You shouldn't have typed university. Or like, what, what, I can't possibly be wrong, you know? I'm just a user, right? And, 
they didn't quite understand that, and that's, that's how we went on to build a search engine, because we realized nobody was focused on that. Now, I think you know, that's true for still very many areas uh, in the world. Uh, there's still, sorry, let me get a drink. Uh, I still see a lot of areas where uh, people don't have that user focus. And I think it's true for most of computing right now. Uh, I was remarking somebody here earlier, you know, if you look back, you know, you took a programmer from 30 years ago. Maybe Eric can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you transplanted them today. Uh, I think they would roughly know what's going on. Like, it's not so different uh, than it was then. In fact, we still use some of Eric's code. It's so good. <laughs> so, so look, let me, let me talk about user experience in terms of Google+. Obviously, we're super excited about Google+. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think, you know, really uh, understanding people better uh, understanding what you want, personalizing that is, is very, very important. And we want to build a closer relationship with all of our users, with all of you guys. And we want to integrate all of our products so they're easier to use, more intuitive. And we want to make sharing in, on the web happen like real life, right? You know, if you're at this conference, you say different things than if you're, uh, you know, in your family or you're with your coworkers or whatever. And that's what circles are, and we're really excited about that. Now, we also wanted to have an amazing experience for mobile. You know, you use actually your phone, probably more than you use your computer now, and uh, that trend is only increasing. And, uh, you know, one of the things we did, which is amazing, is when you take a picture with Google+, it automatically gets uploaded, and then you can, you know, in seconds, you can share it, decide who you want to share it with. It's just a totally magical experience. Like, you don't have to worry about anything. It just happens. Now, also, Willam, who's here, uh, recently did a, uh, a hangout with us, which we're really excited about. And uh, this is a serendipitous interaction where you basically just, you know, enter a video conference, but with people all around the world, uh, and you can have a great conversation with them. And uh, he did this recently. He's going to do it again Friday. Uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, he's running a concert, uh, which will be really exciting. Uh, but we're looking forward to that. Now, this, uh, you know, search is also very important to us, obviously. So when you do search, uh, we really want you to be able to have a great experience. And for that, you know, knowing what other people like, uh, what they're plus wanting, uh, what things people are sharing is super important, and you can already see that happening in search. And we're really excited about that. If you do a search on Google, someone's plus one it, uh, you'll see it right in your search results. And that's a big, big deal. I'm really pleased with Google Plus so far. Uh, it's been a, you know, the team has been doing an amazing job. It's really on fire. I'd love for all of you to sign up. Uh, I think you got an opportunity to do that, but I'd love for you to do that and see Will's concert on Friday. Uh, and, and participate, and really help us build that future uh, as a community. I'm really excited about that. So let me just switch gears for a second and talk a little bit about uh, really talking about how you choose what to do. And one thing I've noticed is that if you're super ambitious, uh, actually it's often easier. Uh, and you know that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but if you have a healthy disregard for the impossible, you actually get better people to work on your project. You know, they get really excited, they work really hard, you know, they work late at night. And uh, it also turns out that most companies aren't crazy enough to do anything like that. And so you don't really know, they, they don't, nobody else is doing it, so you're, you're the only ones. Uh, and again, you get the best people. Now, you know, we try to do a lot of things like that. And I'll just give you some examples uh, from the past. You know, when we bought Android, it was a small company. It was 2005 when we bought it. Uh, and they had a dream that they were going to use an open source operating system for phones to really standardize an industry 
uh, and make things really productive. I mean, that was a crazy goal, right? It was something like 20 people uh, at the time. And you had a whole industry. We had a whole uh, closet full of phones that all didn't work. Uh, something like 100 phones we had in a closet. And we had to write software for each individual one. Um, but having that ambitious dream and a long-term focus, they were really able to succeed. And obviously, Android's the largest uh, shipping smartphone operating system now. Um, that did take six years, right? Now, I feel like, you know, in thinking about this, uh, I see the same movie playing out again and again. You know, people thought that uh, Android was crazy at the time. They also think that many of the businesses we're doing now is, is crazy, it's crazy now. And in fact, you know, I look at things like Chrome, people say, oh, why do you need another browser? You know, there's plenty of browsers. You know, we've got 160 million people using Chrome, and it's growing like crazy. Uh, and it's how you access the internet. That's an important thing, right? And uh, display advertising. You know, people say, oh, there's all these big providers of display advertising. Um, you know, what are you guys going to do? Uh, now we're a huge provider of display advertising. And um, I'm really excited about that because it's growing like crazy also. But it's also really uh, funding all the content that's on the internet. That's an important thing is to fund that content that gets created and to do it better, um, to do it with a better user experience, uh, to make the ads more relevant to people and more useful to people. And we're really applying the science of what we did with search advertising to display advertising. It's working great. And it's not that surprising. But uh, you know, if you watched Ray Kurzweil's talk earlier, you know, people get confused that you know, when you have something that's growing quickly, you, know, you think it's small. And then the next day, basically, it's huge. Uh, and that's what I've seen with all these businesses. YouTube, uh, which Mark, for some reason, thinks we shouldn't have bought. I disagree. Um, I think it was a great acquisition. Um, you know, we have over 3 billion playbacks a day there. Um, and that's growing like crazy also. And we've uh, uh, multiplied our ad revenue by 3x uh, for two years in a row, uh, which has been amazing too. And that's gonna, it's a huge business. It's going to be a much bigger business. So what, what's the takeaway from this? I think if you have a, a well-run technology business and it has a lot of usage, um, you generally make a lot of money uh, over the long term, if you take a long-term view. And that's how we've operated our company. And I think related to that, you know, if you look at uh, short-term and long-term change, uh, it's very, and this is a well-known kind of research fact, people tend to overestimate the next year what's going to happen. You know, you sort of see the trajectory, you see what's going to happen, and you assume that it's going to happen much faster than it actually does. But when you look at the next five years, you really uh, underestimate that effect, especially of the exponential type growth systems that Ray was talking about. And I think that in technology, you know, we're still very, very, very early stage. So we're way overestimating the next year, and we're way underestimating the next five years. And what we try to do is to make sure we're, we're driving the next five years. And, and I think that's our job. Now, what are these things? Well, I think the tools that we use for interacting online uh, are going to be completely different five years from now. You know, if you think five back five years ago, or six, seven years ago, we had no, no social network tools, really. Uh, you know, just things were completely different. And I think if you look five years from now, they're going to be completely different again. Uh, there's a lot of user interface issues with what we're doing. There's a lot of potential to make people's lives better, uh, to make things more efficient, uh, to make things uh, more enjoyable uh, for people. And we're, we're trying hard to build those tools as Google+, and we're super excited about that. I also thought I'd mention mobile briefly. You know, it's not that long since we've had a phone in our pocket, right? And the phone is really a computer. It's connected to the internet. It's actually as good as your desktop computer was three or four years ago already. And it knows where you are. Uh, it's always with you. And those capabilities are just going to completely change the world. And we're very, very early on in that, too. Uh, we just launched uh, last week uh, uh, mobile payments, our wallet product. Uh, and you can use an Android phone uh, without a wallet. Use our wallet. 
uh, and you can buy something, and it's an amazing experience. You just tap, and you can pay for it. Your phone keeps track of it. It's secure. It's an amazing experience. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of these kind of applications for phones. Now, I'll just finish here and say that you know, technology is really changing the world. You know, we all know that. Uh, it can really improve billions of people's lives, uh, and that's what, that's what we're excited about. I think we at Google, we have tremendous uh, responsibility to really carry that mission forward, uh, to make the world better. That's why I'm here, uh, why I love technology, and why I love my job here at Google. So thank you. Now, I've asked Eric to join me because he knows how to answer the really hard questions. <laughs> and uh, how do we have a seat? we're going we're gonna to take some questions. I thought, um, first, I think for everybody here, I really appreciate you all spending uh, two days with us. I was trying to think of a quote or one of the sessions. Uh, there were so many that I've enjoyed. And I think feedback from you is consistent. I know, Larry, you feel the same way. I thought I would read while you're getting your thoughts together and your voice back a quote from Cory Booker yesterday morning. But yet we as Americans who drink deeply from the wells of freedom and liberty that we did not dig, we lavishly eat from the banquet tables that were prepared for us by our ancestors. We are too often just sitting around getting drunk on the sacrifice and struggle of other people's labors and forgetting that we're part of a noble mission in humanity. The first nation formed not as a monarchy, not as a theocracy, but as an experiment an idea that a diverse group of people, that when we come together, e pluribus unum, that we can make a greater whole out of the sum of the parts. And I think if that gives a sense of what we as Google have been trying to achieve, both with you in all the things we've talked about, and if I may say in the vision that you've outlined for our company, that the sum is more than the, than the parts, I think that gets a sense of what we're trying to do here. Um, I think it might be better, rather than me asking Larry questions, or you guys ask, ask Larry questions, um, and me, if you like. The hard, the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But we've done this together a long time, and it's been a privilege for the two of us in these conferences to meet at the end with everybody. So we have some microphones there, or people can raise their hands, whatever you'd like to do. We have a few minutes for this. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Let's get a start. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you're having more fun in the last two years or in the first two years in Google. Larry? Uh, well, yeah, we should ask Eric for his first two years, too. I think the first two years were really stressful. I mean, uh, I As opposed know. to now? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. We, we, we had this debate. So, so the company didn't have any money. So Larry comes up to me and says, well, we have all this money. We're still not doing anything with it. And I said, we're supposed to save the money, Larry. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don't you remember the near bankruptcy, a few things like that? Near bankruptcy? Yeah, yeah. Remember when? those deals? Yes. We had this conversation. Uh, we actually have never used all that much cash, honestly. But... Uh, <laughs> Don't you remember the cash restriction program? The crap program where we wouldn't pay our bills? No, not really. Why? Uh, I think the first two years were really stressful. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think any of you who've started companies probably know this, but I mean, it's really hard to start a company. It's a lot of work, and uh, uh, you don't really have anything. You know, we couldn't figure out how to pay ourselves. You know, there's just a lot of things you have to do, and I, I think you know, we, are, we are lucky now to have a, a good infrastructure as, as a company and lots of really great people working. Uh, so definitely, I think the... It's gotten easier as we've gone along. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, John. How do you? Uh, well, didn't you just do a panel? I'm sorry. <laughs> I just couldn't help myself with this question. And you did actually write the, one of the authoritative books on Google. So you I think you have almost every author of a book on Google here. So. Excellent. Um, uh, I, I'm curious, over the past 13 years, for at least 11 and a half of them, when people thought Google, they would think search. Um, that was the Google brand. It was very, very simple. Google equals search. 
what does the Google brand equal in the next phase of Google's life? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that uh, for me, what I'd like the brand to be uh, represent is that some of the things that I talked about, uh, I think that it would, uh, I think it's important that people trust the brand. Uh, I think that that's very important to us that uh, people know that uh, we're acting in their interest uh, and that we're trustworthy, uh, both stewards of information, information access, and their own personal data, uh, which we've worked really hard to do. Uh, you know, with things like Gmail and security and other things that we do. Uh, and I, I think also it should stand for, uh, uh, you know, kind of a beauty of technological purity of uh, really innovation uh, and, and things that are important to people, uh, but really uh, driving technology forward. Go ahead. I don't think it's on. Oh, there it is. Um, so you just recently announced uh, a, a substantial uh, acquisition of, of Motorola. Um, and what I wanted to know was, does this represent uh, a new era for Google of greater risk taking? Um, and, and also, can you, can you talk a little bit about um, how you will uh, subsume this, this very large organization and, and, and essentially double the size of Google uh, once this is, transaction is completed? Yeah, double in headcount. Uh, I, th I think, you know, while uh, obviously uh, Motorola's significant, uh, Motorola Mobility is significant uh, size acquisition, um, it's, you know, it's not, uh, not doubling our market cap as much as we would like it to. Uh, uh, it's, it's relatively small in that sense. So I think, uh, I think you know, as a company, we've always, uh, we've always strived to uh, make investments, uh, make significant investments in the future. Remember when we did the YouTube acquisition, which was being debated, that was a very large acquisition at the time, and I think it ended up being an amazing acquisition for us. Um, but relatively speaking, it was very large. So I think we've always strived to take those kind of risks and, and identify those opportunities. That's why we get paid us to, is to do that. Uh, so I don't see it as particularly different. Um, but I think we're really uh, excited about the opportunities in mobile. Uh, and uh, you could see that with the tremendous growth of Android and so on. And Motorola had bet big on uh, being an Android partner, uh, you know, basically before anybody else had done that. Uh, and so they went all Android. And so there's a very natural uh, 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 partner for us uh, in doing that acquisition. Go ahead. Uh, so my question plays a bit off the last one. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion this afternoon about patent law and patent development. And your company probably epitomizes what the best of the best of what can happen from technology transfer, uh, from innovation and patents, especially from within higher education. Can you just talk a bit about, about that process of, of, of fostering and managing the transition and the technology transfer from patent and creation, especially within higher education, to actually business development? And, and what more maybe we could do to unlock what seems to be a tremendous amount of, kind of hidden potential uh, within university walls especially. Well, Stanford actually benefited a great deal from the invention of these two young graduate students financially as well as in many other ways. Yeah, we did give Stanford a little bit of equity, uh, which they appreciated, I think. Um, in, in return for the, the technology development we did at Stanford, we're very grateful uh, for that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Stanford has been one of the greatest environments to do that in, uh, most successful place. And I think uh, it's a culture of, you know, they actually, the computer science department at Stanford would let its professors go start companies. And they'd, you know, do a company for a couple of years, they make some money, uh, and they come back to school and be a professor again. And I don't know very many other places where that, that has happened repeatedly and with a large percentage of the faculty. And so actually when we went to start Google, you know, we asked our professors, hey, you know, what should we do? They said, oh, you just talked to this guy, he funded me, and this guy, and, you know, then all of a sudden we had a check and we were, we were able to get going. And so I think that culture of innovation uh, and academia being linked is a really important thing uh, and doesn't happen very many places. Uh, so I'd say that first. You know, I would say also when we did have patents and so on, uh, we have never sued anyone over those things, uh, although we've been sued many, many times ourselves and yet somehow we've been successful. 
So I, I do think that there's an element in technology and software moving really quickly uh, and innovating and actually doing new stuff uh, rather than just uh, trying to use the legal system to prevent other people from doing things. Okay, go ahead. There's a question for both of you. How have your management styles changed at each size of the company as it scaled from small 20, 30, 40 employees up to today? I'd say we're a lot smarter in how we manage. Uh, one of the things about Google that's always sort of bothered me is always, Google's always had this reputation of sort of the craziness. But in fact, the internals of the company are just remarkably tightly managed. And it's always a surprise to people. And uh, if you look at the quality and we, our sales force has run, the analytical nature of the decisions, uh, we're very much at the state of the art, probably the best in the world, in my humble opinion. So I think we, we as a management team developed systematic ways of managing innovation at scale using data analytics that are the envy of the world. Um, once everybody kind of buys into that, the environment becomes much less political. You know, people can't throw random facts around without proof. Um, and we encourage uh, all of this. I think Larry, uh, while you're thinking about how you want to answer this, I would say Larry's contribution, which has not been told, is Larry has a particularly good judgment around sort of the ability of somebody to enter such a highly intense environment. It's a particularly good skill for recruiting. And I think when you try to think about assembling corporations, and obviously this is an ad for ourselves, of the kind of people who can do this, you need the kind of person who's quick and smart, but also able to change their views based on new facts. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, recently I, I reorganized a bit to focus on product areas. And uh, I, I think, you know, in any company as it grows, you know, if the company's not static, which it shouldn't be, uh, you know, as it grows and it changes, uh, you know, you need to reorganize it. And this question is, you know, are you keeping ahead of that? And uh, looking at the, uh, our business, is pretty complicated. We have all these different products. We have advertising, we have search, we have Chrome, we have Android, uh, we have YouTube and so on. Uh, and uh, those things are actually relatively different. Uh, they have different, different things going on. So I think uh, you know, I kind of moved that up a level in the company and made sure that we were super focused in each of those areas on what our user experience was. Uh, and I think that's, that's helped. But just generally, as you switch to a company, as we got more offices, you know, as we got time zone differences, we had to change how we did our meetings, uh, change how we do our employee communications and so on. So, so I just think, you know, in our technology business is growing rapidly, you just need to make sure you're changing everything you know, you're being responsive to that change and changing everything, you know, every year, or else you're just not keeping up with it. The other final comment is that when you're growing as fast as we did, um, most of your executives in our case were probably in their 30s. So I tend to think of them as when we hired them at that age, but five years later, they are battle-scarred veterans of our industry. So building that knowledge base and keeping those employees, and in particular those executives who can move so quickly, is a real art and fundamental, I think, to the success of fast-growing high-tech companies. Why don't we go over here? I was just thinking when you were saying the company is you know, 13 years old, I mean, that means you're in your corporate adolescence, which is shocking considering the size. And then if you think of Ray Kurzweil's that technology evolves um, exponentially, where are you going to be in another 13 years or 20 years? I mean, can you even envision that? Well, one way to do the math is to simply assume that Moore's Law will continue. Uh, Moore's Law is roughly doubling every two years, which turns out to be roughly a thousand times in 20 years. So pretty, pretty amazing numbers. So you'll have a Google in your pocket. Um, yeah, and so, so the ability to ask questions, when you have that amount of computing power with all the telemetry and knowing everything going on in the world real time, is tantalizing. Absolutely tantalizing what would be possible. And some speakers have talked about it, but the automated car stuff is a good example of, of this possibility. Uh, and it was an area where I just had some interest in since I was a grad student. And uh, it seemed pretty practical, actually. I mean, you think that driving a car is hard, but it's not actually that hard for a computer. And uh, if the computer actually has good data like about what's around it. Look, the, our computers drive our, your car better than you do when you're drunk. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd hope right? so. I'd hope so. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean that's our starting point. Uh, 
or when you're 16 or when you're really old or um, <laughs> they actually work better than I think they'll they'll work substantially better than an average person uh, and and get better from there and in, continue improving as was mentioned uh, so you know you'll get a software update and your car will be safer right which is great um, so I think uh, just looking at the potential there, there there's uh, uh, the issues we have in a lot of these areas is that people aren't working on them and you know in fact before the the DARPA grand challenge that happened there's very few people working in the area the grand challenge gave it you know a big contest got more people working in it and when we asked the people who are working in the area, well, why don't we have an automated car? Why can't I buy one, right? It should be a great thing to be able to do. Um, there's something like three million people killed worldwide a year in auto accidents. I mean, there's a lot of people uh, that die and a lot more that are injured. Uh, and there's a lot of other benefits you get from the automation too. The people spend two hours a day in the U.S. commuting, which is, you know, a huge amount of time uh, that they don't need to be spending. Uh, you know, they could be doing useful things during that time or watching TV or, or you know, looking at ads or whatever. Um, so, uh, but anyway, we asked people, why aren't you doing it? And they said, well, we don't know how to, we can't figure out how to actually do it. And, you know, the regulatory issues and all these other kind of things. So I think part of our roles as a catalyst to make sure that some of these things actually start up and happen uh, and make sure that we push through the, the difficult issues to make it real. And, and I think it's a privilege to be at Google in the sense that one of the privileges is that the gross margins are high enough that we can afford some of these things to a reasonable scale, and other companies are not so fortunate. Yes, sir. With that said, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of ideas and opportunities here. How does Google set boundaries and focus for their businesses so they don't get lost like so many companies have before you? Yeah, I, I mean, I've done a lot of thinking about other companies and how they've succeeded or failed. Um, and tried to really be a student of that. I think most companies, as they add people, they don't do more things. So just as a first approximation, you know, if the company doubles in headcount over time, uh, typically it has much the same businesses as it had before. Uh, and so I think that's somewhat frustrating, both for the company to grow and, and for the people inside and, and all that. Uh, so, you know, we've tried to actually maintain kind of a linear uh, a number there. As we're adding people, we're adding businesses. Uh, and I think that's challenging at our scale. You know, but I think it's a really good goal to have. Um, but these things that we're adding need to be significant, right? They can't just be, you know, we're going to do horoscopes or something. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, back in the 90s, the big giants, the gorillas, the sort of secretive companies were IBM and Motorola way back when. And when they did things, everybody in the industry would jump. And somehow that mantle shifted over in the aughts to Microsoft and AT&T, which are still kind of wearing that mantle. And we've had a little bit of light joking here about, oh, Google's becoming a little Microsoft-like and so forth. I have an opinion on that question. Exactly. <laughs> and there's been a little bit of a kerfluffle about the real names policy on Google+, Plus, which turned into the NIM Wars, if you look, for, if you look that up. Um, in this new world, if you do really want to be trustworthy, a piece of that is openness and transparency. And there's some openness and transparency here. But another piece of it seems to be, to be about intent and authenticity and maybe even vulnerability in different ways. What are you doing to communicate better than you do now? Because what I, when I see the Nim Wars transaction happening out there, I see you not being heard or not communicating well. I see communities not really engage there properly so that this can simply be resolved in a really great way for both parties or for all parties. Now, I, don't, I don't think there's one answer that makes everybody happy, but I think there's a way to conduct the conversation that might be a lot better. I, I actually see this as our responsibility to some extent. I, I, you know, we had a panel on, on media and so on this morning. Um, I think that uh, we as important people uh, who are trying to improve the internet and how it works, uh, I think it's important for uh, the internet uh, and, and that whole ecosystem of information, how it's shared, how it's analyzed and so on to work better. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, you know, if you ask anyone about, uh, about how that information is getting propagated, you know, how people are deciding what to focus on and all those kind of things, I think it could work a lot better than it does now. And so I see the issues we have with communication as being a special case, kind of the world as a whole. You know, if you ask any company that question, they'll have similar issues or you ask any politician or, or anybody who's dealing, uh, who's in that public eye. So I think, I think we as an internet community, we have a responsibility to make those things work a lot better 
and to get people focused on what are the real issues, what, what should you be thinking about. Um, and, and I think we as a whole are not doing a good job of that at all. Go ahead. Um, since this conference is so much about innovation and we all appreciate how important competition is to all of that, uh, let's say you had just made a new acquisition of a greeting card company and you were sitting down with the management team and uh, they gave you the assignment of writing a get well card to Yahoo. What would that say? I think that I appreciate, I appreciate your question. It's, um, I think it's a, as a good policy, Google should talk about Google. And aside from my snide comments about one of our former competitors, uh, we should keep our mouths shut. With respect to Yahoo, uh, Yahoo has been both a partner and a competitor for Google for a very long time. Um, and I think that they need to sort out their, their leadership issues, which I know they're working very hard on. And I think that's probably all we should really say. Go ahead. Um, so my question is with regards to uh, the scale Google is going to be growing at. Uh, we're all aware of how it's grown, thinking about the Moore's Law, and, and it's just going to go exponentially higher. Now, in this process, you would require very, very high quality talent uh, and students coming out of great universities now. I know this is an incredibly challenge, uh, challenging thing that's confronting you guys because it's not like Stanford is uh, also admitting exponentially higher number of students or, or the best universities. Uh, what's your plan? What are you guys thinking? Is this something that's bothering you at this stage? Always. Yeah, um, I have been hassling universities that they should be growing more. Uh, but, and, they, and they are working on that in various ways, but I, I do think it's a fundamental issue with uh, the higher education, although we did see numbers this morning, right, that the numbers are increasing a lot over time. We do have a, a very serious issue about people being excited about going into technology uh, and, and computer science specifically. Uh, and actually, Will I am and, and I were talking about that at lunch. We were saying, you know, how do we make uh, being a computer scientist sexy? How do we get people to actually want to do that? Uh, and I actually made the point that I think that some of the uh, base technologies we use are very uh, kludgy. You know, it's kind of a hazing thing. You have to learn these special command line things with weird names and so on. I guess that's Eric's fault, actually. Uh, um, but I think we could do a lot to make the, the actual core technology more accessible, combined more with art and uh, the, the beautiful aspects of it and get that all going and, and more accessible to people. And that, would be, that would have a huge impact. There's a lot of diversion away from what we need and we need to stop that. I think the other thing is the, the mindless and stupid policy that we have with respect to immigration of smart people into America uh, needs to get fixed and it's a national crisis. Why don't we finish up with the questions, folks who are standing right here, and it, you can, if you have, you can be the last one too, and that'll be because I want we're going to run over time, but I want to make sure we accommodate everybody's questions. Steve, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so when I uh, talk about uh, Google, which was generous enough to uh, cooperate with me uh, when I wrote a book, I get asked two questions. John Battelle uh, sort of t covered the first one. The second one is the people ask me is so what is the biggest threat to Google's continued success? So to help me uh, give it from the horse's mouth. What, 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 how should I answer that? Google. The, 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 problems, the problems in a company of Google's scale are always internal at some level. Hmm. Yeah, that's why I said Google. You know, Larry... <laughs> Larry uh, so, actually, actually I've, been, I've been saying something like that, so thanks. So Larry, Larry actually, um, you, you didn't sort of talk about your management memo. But, but one of the things that he did after he became CEO in correcting all the messes that I handed to him no, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> were to, were, he wrote a very, very defined memo about innovation, how decisions are made, and so forth. And it's, it's, a, it's large companies are their own worst enemy mm. because internally they know what they should do, but they don't do it. And if I may say, my, my business partner and close friend Larry, what does he do all day? He's doing that. He's in there forcing the discussion, forcing the choice, and forcing the resolution, right? Sort of with his sort of unique talents. And I think that's, that will ultimately determine how hugely successful Google is or not. Yeah, one of the interesting things we noticed was that uh, companies correlate on decision making and speed of decision making. There are basically no companies that have good, good slow decisions. There are only companies that have good, fast decisions. 
Uh, and so I think that's also a natural thing. As companies get bigger, they tend to slow down decision making, and that's pretty tragic. Thanks a lot. Yeah. The acquisition of Motorola um, has given you access to an important patent trove, but Motorola are also the largest manufacturer of set-top boxes in America, which obviously gives you uh, an interesting springboard into digital television. Was that part of the strategy? It was certainly something we considered, yes. Uh. <laughs> We have to be, to be careful because under the rules, we can't really talk about Motorola. It's a separate company today. But I will tell you that when we both looked at Motorola, the quality of both their current products, but more importantly, what's coming in the future is amazing stuff. And so, you know, sort of hold that question until we sort of see that coming out. Go ahead. Uh, looking back at these 13 years, which ones do you consider your biggest mistakes? Year seven, <laughs> prime numbers, no. Um. I remember we, uh, we uh, initially did not get a Yahoo deal, actually, for ads uh, way back when. Uh, and uh, we actually were kind of debating what to do, and we didn't have that much money, and we were going to have to spend more money than we had. Uh, so I actually think we made, we made a big mistake in not having enough capital available uh, in order to do that. Uh, and that caused a whole series of other things. I think when, when companies grow as fast as Google does, you, you, it's hard to sort of look back and say what was the best year or the worst year. They're all good, right? And whatever mistakes you made, you made because you were winning somewhere else. So you, you can't really sort of look at it in isolation. And I can think about, in my contribution to the company, uh, obviously I worked hard, and I should have done 10 things but what was I doing? Oh, I was busy working on these other things, which are really well. So I think you have to judge in total, and I would argue that, that the total story is, is quite a good one about Google, as I think we're all right here. Yes, sir. That's the most frustrating thing about business is you don't get to run them the other way. There's no control. You can't run. There's no control experiment you can run. And by the way, you're the only person in the world, Larry, who would ever say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sir, so, you're going to have the honor of the last question. Um, this won't be a good one um, because it won't be a question. It'll just be just kind of a, just a great bravo. Um, I was talking to Ariana. Is she here by any chance? Uh, she was just here. We were having lunch, and I was fortunate enough to have lunch with her. And everybody heard the conversation between Ted and, and Ari, Ariana. And so I, I, I'll throw something out to you we talked about. If that conversation happened back in time with Rosa Parks, kind of stealing from the mayor, and the argument was the news, the way it's being produced today, will go back in time. If you had a camera crew and you followed Rosa Parks and you entered the camera, you entered the bus, you captured the story, you put it on the network, phenomenal story, our documentary. The advantage you have is that story, I live in New York, we have 168 different languages, five different boroughs. Can you imagine how that story would be translated, being sent to mobile and social? and the ramifications of how that would impact societies. So when news people talk about journalism, they really mean societal change. So I think that before connected TV, even before the 80% world gets connected, where you'll play with media, I represent local TV, is a story will start, and through the Android, and through, I'm not just saying this be nice, but Google+, because Facebook won't let us embed content and make money, I'll say that again, Facebook won't let us embed content and make money. You will. You have a chance to have the droids talk to the community, the community give us information back, and for Google Plus to be the facilitator of dialogue. So I think you guys are phenomenally positioned for the future. Well, thank, thank you. I, I like to think about, in my lifetime, how much information is now current. Uh, I grew up during the Vietnam War, the negotiation that that ended up ending the Vietnam War consisted of letters going through the Pakistani em embassy that took a week and a half to go back and forth. Right, just think about it. Think about the 60s and the red phone, Russia, and so forth. So over a 50-year period, right, the impact of communications and knowledge is so much more profound than any of us can possibly imagine. I think if you take the vision that Larry laid out, which I think we all fully support and, and are running with him to make him. The changes in society in the next 50 years will be equally as dramatic. 
Larry? Yeah. <laughs> I think we should get people to their planes and all that. Thank you all. Thank you, Nikesh. <laughs>